Uh, good evening. Uh, it's absolutely a pleasure to welcome you, uh, you all for this very exciting session on intellectual property, the unsung hero of the pandemic. Uh, as we get into the session, I just wanted to make a few remarks. If you really look at it, uh, this pandemic has been the worst crisis that humanity has faced in the last hundred years. But how did we really get about uh, managing this? How did we really get about encountering the challenges that the world was facing? I think there were multiple sets of things. There, were, there was a huge healthcare crisis, as everybody knows. There, this, there was this virus, which was a big unknown. Uh, and then, of course, there were this whole huge mental health issues that were coming through because of we were just not really communicating with, with each other or we were just simply locked down. Uh, but if you really look at it, the outcomes that we are seeing are hugely positive, And those outcomes have happened for a simple reason that it has been a huge collaborative effort of the industry, of the governments, of various sets of not-for-profit enterprises, or various players in the system. It's, it is something where what we are really seeing right now, the success that we are seeing right now in terms of managing the pandemic is a collaborative effort. It is a, a, it's a show of human resilience. If you really look at it, uh, I, I think uh, in terms of the magnitude of the crisis, there are close to about 220 million cases that we have seen until now, close to about 5 million deaths. But what we are seeing right now is, that we are getting back to normal and how that normalcy is being restored. It is because of enterprises uh, like Zoom or uh, people like Bio or uh, what you call enterprises across the world who were doing scientific research or people who were there and uh, who were really pushing forward uh, the idea of research and dissemination of research. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I would just quickly like to jump into the conversation and we have a very, very uh, interesting group of people with us. Uh, we have Elizabeth Krosik, uh, who is the head of uh, government affairs for EU and global policy lead on AI for uh, RELCS. Uh, we have Komal Kala, who's the associate director, IP and trade policy for International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Association. We have Josh, Josh Kalmer, uh, who's the head of global public policy and government relations for Zoom. We have Hans Sauer, who's the deputy general counsel and vice president for intellectual property, Bio. Uh, so in fact, as we get into the conversation, uh, my first question that I, that I really wanted to ask uh, as we move into this thing is that Zoom has, let, let's start with Zoom, Josh, here. Like, you know, like there was this pandemic that we were facing and Zoom became quite ubiquitous uh, as the pandemic began. Of course, there are those sets of conversations on the fatigue, uh, that there, there was a Zoom fatigue or whatever. At the end of the day, uh, Zoom is something which has really enabled us to survive this pandemic. And of course, uh, there are many other softwares which have become second nature. Uh, this enabled a lot of business and social contact to continue. Uh, but Zoom has not happened overnight. A lot of people would wonder that Zoom is an overnight success. It, it probably happened much way back in the past. Could you just tell something more about what was really happening and how did Zoom come about? Sure. Yeah, happy to, Amit. And thank you. Um, thank you for, for moderating into the WTO. I actually have my background is as a trade negotiator. So this is taking me back. It's wonderful to be connected with. Um, I see a lot of old friends and so forth. Um, yeah, it's it's fascinating. Zoom is actually 10 years old uh, this year. Um, we started out in 2011 uh, as a, an enterprise video communications company focused almost entirely on large organizations, financial institutions, universities, multinational corporations. And, and the idea was to, to provide what we call a video first uh, communications platform and, and to really regularize video technology as a, as a key means of communication uh, for people. Um, I had the just the luck of being familiar with the company because my former organization used it. But as, as most people know, it, it was just not a well-known uh, company. Uh, the, the pandemic has been transformative for, for, for Zoom, for all kinds of video conferencing services, for all kinds of tech companies. Uh, we saw our usership grow by a factor of about 35 between December of 2019 and April of 2020. And the, the, the growth has uh, not increased at the same rate since then, but it has continued to do that over the last 18 months uh, for, for obvious reasons. Um, but what in a way has been equally interesting and, and, and very relevant to my day-to-day -day work, in addition to this quantitative change and this need to, to scale up the business 
and to have it be technically uh, available and reliable was the, the qualitative change and the recognition that as you diversify your use cases, as you diversify the ways in which people experience the platform and use the platform, so it's no longer just uh, big companies and universities, but now smaller organizations, civil society, yoga classes, what have you, you have to think about a lot more things. You have to really come to terms with the fact that now you've got lots of customers that don't have their own IT departments, that don't have their own security officers. You need to be thinking through security and privacy and baking those things into your DNA. And so, so much of our journey over the last year and a half has been about creating that mindset to be alongside the product and to, to innovate the mindset just as we innovate the product. Um, IP is a part of that as well, because of course, uh, like most any technology company, there's a, there are a lot of uh, proprietary considerations in, uh, in what you're developing. And, and we certainly had a number of those in our first eight and a half years that were, that were paramount. But just as the use cases have diversified, uh, the ways in which we think about IP have as well. And I think we'll talk about them in a little more detail uh, later, but you can, you know, th this group is, is much better positioned than I am to, to let its imagination run wild and just think, you know, what, what's happening now that you've got uh, an events component to the platform, you've got smaller organizations, political bodies, you've got, uh, you've got music, you've got different kinds of content. Uh, what kind of a company is Zoom gonna be? And the questions around IP are very closely related to that. We're very interesting, uh, Josh, but quick, quickly uh, getting Elizabeth into the conversation. Uh, Elizabeth, as RELC's group, uh, can you tell me more about uh, what you will, what, what's your enterprise and your role uh, as an industry or as a publisher and in terms of like how, what you've done or what, how you responded to the uh, pandemic? Uh, in fact, we all uh, grew up, in fact, I can just simply tell you that I grew up reading nature which is your public yeah. <laughs> so, right? So that's my favorite magazine, but still, uh, the floor is yours, please. Over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I guess from the sublime to the ridiculous, everybody knows Zoom. I was just saying to Josh before, you know, it's kind of a, its own verb. And very few people know Relic by its name, but people might know its product. So Elsevier, which is obviously a publisher of uh, academic articles, but more and more, uh, uh, it, it's much more than about information-based analytics and decision tools. I don't know if there are any lawyers in the audience. They may know LexisNexis. We do risk as well. So it's quite a diverse company. Um, and I'm actually very proud of how we've stepped up, uh, us and many, many others. So, you know, this platform is just a few companies and a few organizations. I know there are many out there who've played their part. But this is, you know, it's great that we can just talk a little bit about, about I suppose, the role we've played. Um, so as a sector, we immediately provided free access to all relevant peer reviewed content and articles. So here I'm talking about the, El the Elsevier part of the business. And by the way, as a sector, that's nothing new. We've always done that. When the WTO announces a global emergency, we open up our information to immediate and free access. Um, Elsevier, which as I said, is a subsidiary of Relic, has traditionally done this through what we call resource centers. So kind of dedicated resource centers that put all the information together. We've done that for Ebola, for Zika, for SARS, and now obviously COVID. And it's not just the kind of still article. Uh, we have always available in machine reading format. You can text and data mine it. You can, you can reuse it. You can do secondary analysis on it. Um, and I mean, just as a little stat, um, between January 2020 and August 2021, we had about 255 million downloaded articles. I, I can believe the size of the number. Um, that is more than the performance of some of the best-selling computer games and, and uh, music tracks. So it's really used. And we also work with bodies like the WHO to create centralized collections and repositories. For my company, one of the things we, we've been very aware of is the importance of speed. So speed is very much the essence of trying to get some, trying to get things out there for COVID whilst not in heart, whilst not compromising on quality, and so we've used a number of AI techniques, machine learning, natural language processing, and so on, to do things like speeding up articles to select them for peer review. So just making sure the pipeline is very fast. Uh, we've been doing things to detect trending topics per domain, so that helps researchers to make more informed decisions about their research. 
Um, we've helped healthcare workers on the front lines access evidence-based clinical overviews and drug monographs, care plans, even procedure videos. Um, and the risk part of business, LexisNexis created a dashboard to track the spread of COVID globally through the analysis of, of open source data sets. So just some of the examples of our and the industry contribution. And you know, to Josh's point, why IP? So first you need to have robust empirical evidence and analytics, and that allows you to draw informed conclusions and make sound decisions. And to Josh's point, you have to continually innovate. So invention and creation are, I guess we would say at the forefront of, of, of human development. And there is a direct link between innovation and economic growth, which is why many governments put it at the center of their growth strategies. And in fact, I recall the IP plan of the European Commission saying that 45% of Europe's GDP um, is IP related and that contribute, contributes to about 30% of all jobs. So IP is a really important part of this. And I know we'll talk about this a bit later. So perhaps I'll let somebody else come in. Sure, uh, th thanks Elizabeth. Uh, but a very important point, as you suggest, uh, innovation and economic growth are so closely intertwined and interlinked. But uh, as we get deeper into the conversation, Hans, uh, media has been talking about big pharma. I, I think that's been the pet uh, thing for the big media or for, for the media uh, after all. Um, but your organization uh, has represented hundreds of very small enterprises or medium and small scale enterprises, uh, which possibly don't have a product. But ca can you just tell us more in terms of like how SMEs have responded to the pandemic? Uh, and then of course, uh, uh, your relationship with universities, enterprises uh, like well, research uh, publishers and so on and so forth. Uh, how, how do you really uh, look at this aspect? Uh, Hans, over to you, please. Yes, well, thank you. The, I think the, the name of the panel is, is a very helpful one for framing debate, right? If, if we talk about unsung heroes, we, um, we, are, we are not thinking about companies and whose names have become household names around the world. If we look at the biotechnology industry, uh, it is well to remember that it's largely an industry of mid and small sized companies, most of which don't have a product on the market, but are development stage companies that leverage uh, capital investment, private investment, as well as their relationships with universities and publicly funded researchers to advance technology. But the typical biotech company is not a large company uh, that sells products that are recognized around the world. Now, the typical biotech company is one whose name you've never heard uh, that doesn't yet make a product. And uh, yet that is part of a class of small and medium sized companies that in the aggregate hold 70% of the biomedical development pipeline, right? That's held by small and medium sized companies. Um, at Bio, we're a, a trade association. Um, we were fortunate enough to have access to uh, a lot of information and input that received from our member companies. And we were able to track uh, as this pandemic unfolded, the range of programs that these companies began to engage in, right? And we've tracked uh, uh, close to a thousand uh, research and development programs that were started in response to the pandemic across the members of our industry, uh, ranging from uh, vaccines to uh, a lot of therapeutic programs, um, uh, diagnostics, and, uh, and, and others that relate to mounting a COVID response. So we're talking 980 programs, over 200 of which have already been discontinued and reported as failed. And that is another hallmark of what biotech is about. The chances of failure of uh, an R&D program are always much, much greater than the chances of success. The current debate over the status that we've reached in the global response of developing COVID countermeasures, I think is often skewed because we're focused on a, a significant number of successes, but the number of successes is really quite small relative to the effort that was mounted by the rest of the industry that we never hear about. So uh, companies um, uh, by and large, it, it was very like profound for us to see 
how willing companies were to seize on COVID as, as a very significant focus of their efforts. Many companies stopped doing other things they would ordinarily have done, right? They incurred opportunity costs by discontinuing or suspending other research and development programs and redirecting these efforts to COVID and COVID countermeasures. Um, we saw significant dedications of equity capital uh, and other resources, expertise and manpower go into these programs. And again, the reality is that most of these will eventually fail and hopefully these companies will get back to doing what they did before um, when this pandemic winds down. Um, but, but it is very important to remember right, that the effort that was mounted by the industry um, it came at a significant cost of opportunity. And uh, I think it was heartening to see how these companies were able to leverage both their existing technology platforms and their existing relationships with each other and with publicly funded research uh, to get into the work. And some of which has produced very significant products that I think we're gonna talk about, including the mRNA vaccines, which was quite unproven technology at the time the pandemic began. What it is on some level, while it is too early to declare complete success and to celebrate why we can't yet celebrate, I do think we can't declare failure either. Um, some of these products are going to be very significant going forward and they're a great triumph, not just of science, but also of collaboration um, and the dedication of researchers, both in public and in private contexts. So Hans, you, you make a very important point, and that is, of course, we cannot celebrate uh, success right now. We're still on the journey that we are seeing. Uh, but there was a very important aspect that actually happened. In fact, uh, as the pandemic started, the first known cases happened in December of 2019. Uh, and somewhere in uh, March of 2020, we were talking about a vaccine getting developed, and we had a vaccine in our uh, stable or on the stable in uh, about June, July of uh, 2020. Uh, th this was something astonishing as to what had actually yes. happened with the pace of uh, development. Typically, uh, we were talking about decades of development uh, and the vaccine would have actually happened. But what what was done? Like, what, how did we get an effective vaccine so quickly? Uh, because there has to be a historical genesis. There were some pillars that were standing which made this happen. Uh, Hans. Yes, I, I, and thank you for, for reminding us what how astonishing I think the achievement is, right? And to the extent it was a success, it has many fathers that we should talk about. But yes, you know, in less than a year, we had multiple safe and effective vaccines that were authorized for human use. This had never happened before and it was not predictable and it was not an accident or a lucky break. Um, uh, the, I think one of the fastest vaccines that had been developed before COVID was the MMR vaccine, which took over four years. And that was considered really fast, right? So this is nothing short of a miracle or nothing short of a demonstration of what we can actually achieve, right? If both the exigencies of the situation requires and if we have the dedication and the will to do it both uh, from governments as well as from industry that's willing to step up. None of this though happened in a vacuum. The uh, I think technology that was used, if we talk only about mRNA vaccines, dates back um, 20 or more years, right? There were decades of research that went into uh, developing these technology platforms, which were luckily at a stage when the pandemic hit, these technologies were luckily at a stage where they could be converted and deployed for COVID. Um, but these weren't meant to be. COVID vaccines, mRNA vaccine technology, for example, was meant to be and will be going forward a, de a drug development platform for metabolic disorders, for cancer drugs, and for other vaccines. Um, uh, Moderna, for example, was is not a very old company. They went public only about five years ago, and everybody knows their name today. But two years ago, they were one of the companies that I talked about whose name hadn't been heard around the world that most people didn't know. Moderna, uh, I think, was able to participate in this effort based on 
um, uh, not just more than a decade of research, but also based on more than $2.6 billion that they had to raise over the years to build out their platform. They were also in a fortuitous position in that they already had a pre-existing relationship with Pfizer, which, uh, to, with whom they had been collaborating since, I believe, 2018. Right? So a lot of things were already in place that helped not just the companies that I mentioned, but all the others who participated that helped them to get off to a running start. Um, therapeutics, uh, right? COVID drugs uh, are, I think, a very good example of this phenomenon. Most of the drugs that we use today to treat sick COVID patients are drugs that existed for other purposes even before the pandemic began. Right? So these drugs also did not fall from the sky. They were developed sometimes a long time ago, but at significant effort uh, by companies, and they were available to be redeployed, repurposed, if you will. Uh, and that too, I think, was a fortunate circumstance that didn't come about by accident. I want to believe all my colleagues in the industry who tell me that uh, the ability to license to each other, the ability of companies to collaborate, and the ability to, uh, in the past, have raised the capital to fund all that research, which built the foundation, was made possible in part also by the help of the IP system. Right? I want to believe that functioning IP systems have uh, uh, something very significant to do with the ability, uh, with our demonstrated ability, uh, to mount a counter response to COVID. So these products, I think, uh, carry a lot of merit and they have a lot of invention in them that benefited from participation in, not rejection of, traditional IP systems. Mm -hmm. So uh, th this is a very interesting, uh, Josh. Uh, uh, but before I go to Komal, uh, Elizabeth, I just really wanted to come back to you in terms of uh, really understanding uh, how do you really look at uh, this whole idea of vaccine development? Things? Because you've been in the middle of all that information and analytics that you were sitting on top of. Now, Elizabeth. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, uh, I think, well, I think uh, um, that Hans made a, a very important point um, that uh, about the relationship between this and, and, and IP. Um, you said um, it took under a year, it took 321 days from the first report that was published in our Lancet, which reported on the clinical symptoms of patients with COVID, to the publication of the safety of the AstraZeneca vaccine. And, and as you said, that was all about cooperation, collaboration and licensing, not the decimation of IP rights or indeed a waiver. I think the very fact that we have that, that the IP of ability allows us, I suppose that protective cover allows us to generate that evidence-based quality insight and resource that you, you mentioned, all the things that we, we can do and bring to the fore, but it also allows us to freely disseminate that during the pandemic. So the benefits of being able to be reliant and dependent on good IP uh, uh, rules allow us to do what we do in such cases as COVID. So they definitely go absolutely hand in hand. And I think, uh, I mean, I, we're going to, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the waiver later, but I mean, honestly, I don't see um, that there is a, um, a, co a connection between having a waiver and doing anything differently. I think this has been an incredible example of really competitive industries, competitive companies doing what they do best and collaborating with others. I, I, I actually, particularly the pharma companies, I think it's, you know, I salute them. I think it's been a really, really incredible achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Just quickly, just moving ahead. Uh, Komal, you know, like we, we created this vaccine, you know, like the world created this, like it was just there. But the biggest thing that had to be done was manufacture and manufacture tons of it or a lots of it. Like we were talking about vaccinating seven to eight billion people, uh, multiple doses or whatever. You, you really had to have a scale up, which was uh, phenomenal. And of course, there were all those kind of debates that you have an mRNA vaccine or you have the other kinds or whatever. And there was the, oh, mRNA is much easier. They're much stable or one is stable versus the other. There are going to be lesser distribution channel challenges. But what about manufacturing? Because that's, that's the key here. Komal. 
Uh, well, thanks, Amit, and uh, you know, thank you for for having us. I think uh, Hans and Elizabeth hit the spot, saying this would not have happened without collaboration. Um, and for us, I think being able to rely on years of research and development, some that you know may have been put aside and kept away, saying this is never going <laughs> to ever see the light of day, were pulled out. So it was literally going in through the libraries to see what could we bring to the table and it worked. Uh, but the next step, as you said, was production, as you can have, you know, theoretically something that goes to clinical trials, but can you actually mass produce it? And that goes to finding our trusted partners. And, you know, whether it was our colleagues at Bio or our colleagues at BCDM, uh, some new collaborations, but also something that Hans touched right in the beginning is that we don't talk about the folks that failed and even big pharma failed. You would have read last week that Sanofi is pulling back um, on their vaccine research, but that doesn't mean that Sanofi is not going to make themselves available to make, you know, uh, other vaccines for the vaccines that are in the market. So it was very important for us. There were a couple of things that we, and I'll just come to the numbers because the numbers are touch wood looking good. Um, we, we wanted to make sure that first and foremost, that the vaccines were safe and efficacious so that um, whatever went out um, is a good product and it, you know is actually fighting COVID. So we went first to our trusted partners, to those that could scale up as well, because as you said, the numbers were in billions. Uh, and please realize that prior to the COVID vaccines, the entire capacity for the world for all vaccines combined was 5 billion. And suddenly um, in January, we needed more than 12 billion within a year. Um, and so we had to be very careful, one, to make sure that we choose the right partner that could scale up, that had the expertise to absorb the technology so that we wouldn't have to spend time in training and technology transfer and make sure that what they produce when it goes to the regulator, it goes fast. Because the other big thing that we are fighting is vaccine hesitancy. Mm -hmm. So while it may have seemed slow in getting the numbers up, I'm very happy to say as of yesterday, we have touched the 7.5 billion mark. Um, by the end of the year, we will be at 12 billion, which is enough to vaccinate the entire adult population uh, of the world. And by June 2020, we're actually looking at a surplus of 24 billion. Um, now, but this comes with a few asterisks because we have faced hurdles in manufacturing, none of which are related to IP. IP has actually been an enabler um, in all of this. Um, <clears throat> the hurdles have actually been on the trade side of the house. And some countries, uh, and, and, and you know, understandably so to some extent, uh, hedging their bets and getting more vaccines than, than others to enable them to do share. Um, we also have seen export and import restrictions, um, uh, you know, and, and country preparedness. That's another big thing because mm -hmm. these vaccines don't have a long shelf life. They have only for six months. And therefore, if there's a dose that is sitting in a country that is close to five months, rolling it out to another country becomes very difficult. And then, uh, you know, the, the issue now almost is getting the vaccines into arms. The production numbers are there. Therefore, when, you know, I mean, this is a, 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 a panel that understands the importance of IP, but it is, you know, this, this is in the minority, this, this panel. There's a lot of misinformation that's out there that we have to fight, um, and especially on the numbers. Uh, but we are, we are there. Uh, but right now, we just have to make sure that countries are actually rolling out their uh, vaccination programs, and those that have access are actually dose sharing. Because, so, just one second, because you have, while we are increasing vaccine production, what a lot of people don't realize is that we are playing, with, not playing, we're making this with a very uh, limited resource of raw materials. Like for example, the vials come from only one place in the world, right? And you are also dealing with very high skilled workers 
which are also limited. So our resources are finite, um, but our numbers have to be high. So that's what we're working with. But please, Amit, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. So, uh, Komal, you make very important points that, of course, manufacturing has happened, but there are certain barriers that actually exist. And barriers are in terms of like either it's a distribution issue or an access issue in terms of really putting it in the arms, uh, how wilds are just getting manufactured at one single location. Now, do, do you think these these sets of issues are uh, what you call creating a challenge for scaling up or is it uh, creating a barrier to uh, scale up? Or if at all, uh, how do we really move, move it forward? Because I am seeing it as an access issue, uh, a behavioral issue uh, more than anything else right now, because there is also that hesitancy and a debate around hesitancy uh, that is also developed. And you, you did allude to that. Uh, Komal, you, know, very quickly, you have exactly two minutes, please. Uh, no, absolutely. So yes, the trade and health dialogue um, is definitely on. The WTO has is, is, got its arms wrapped around it. Um, it's it's one of the big issues at MC12. Uh, but these trade barriers, they honestly, they have come down. So in 2020, they were over 200. We're looking at 63, and that is genuinely um, government's uh, missions, the WTO uh, industry, you know, having an open dialogue about this issue. But we still see hesitancy in door sharing, though that too has started. Um, we as industry, across industry, which includes bio, uh, I know Hans is here, uh, pharma and our other sister associations actually presented a five-step plan for vaccine equity of which dose sharing, country readiness and trade barriers were the top three issues that we were facing. Um, we of course get hit and I know that there are a lot of questions on, oh, there's no licensing happening and there's no technology transfer happening, which is also a myth because despite all the challenges, we have over 300 collaborations. Um, we have production sites close to 100 in the world. Um, out of the 300, over 300 collaborations, we have over 225 that involve technology transfer. These numbers change on a daily basis, so I may be dated by a few days on this. Um, but the other two steps I do also want to address um, that we've highlighted, and that is about uh, scaling up manufacturing, which we are very happy to say that we are meeting those numbers. And last but not the least is on the constant improvement on innovation. You need that. We've all heard about the variants. It's not as if you know, COVID happened in 2020, we have you know, the, the pathogen and that's it. We have to constantly improve to fight the variants. We have to make sure that our therapeutics and I know there's a lot of work that's happening on therapeutics as well, though lots of people are not talking about that. And even in that, we've had so many collaborations. We've had, it just from, from the associations and the members that we represent, 86 companies have licensed to another 86 companies covering literally the entire world. Um, at, you know, supplying whether it's a remesdevir or molnupinavir or the Roche drug, which I always mispronounce, so I apologize. Um, but, you know, so all of this is happening, um, but the focus, unfortunately, has become an emotional issue on IP rather than addressing the real trade barriers. And if you talk to anyone in the field, whether it's Elizabeth who's, you know, got, got the papers or Josh who's making sure that, you know, our folks can talk to each other or whether it's, uh, you know, Hans's uh, members, who you know, literally are sinking in every last penny into this, or the big pharma companies as well, or the DCVM folks that are the largest manufacturers in the world on the generic side. Everyone has told you the same thing. These are the barriers, please address them first. Do not be distracted by old conversation. And, but health is an emotional argument, so. Thank, thank you, Komal, <laughs> of course, like, this is an important, discussion that we are having, you know, like, I, ha I have to ask this question, you know, like, and uh, I, I would like to start with Hans, you know, like, uh, Hans, you, you, you've been, you've looked at this whole discussion on IP uh, that's been happening and IP waiver that people have been talking about. Somehow I d disagree with this whole proposition personally on this IP waiver because, uh, and people have started talking about in October of uh, uh, last year, uh, and uh, even before uh, we had effective therapies and things, um, and I do not know what under the sun were they thinking when they were really uh, saying it. Uh, 
and I do not know how IT waiver can actually help because given what I, what we have seen in the world, this whole huge collaborative effort, which has created an amazing success story, which has saved, I, I would personally want to say that saved humanity of many skirmishes. Uh, and, and I don't see there has been any barrier to development of a vaccine. Why, why this debate? Like what, what is this IP waiver all about? And what, what's the goal that we are really trying to achieve? And do we need it at all? Uh, Hans, over to you, please. Oh my goodness. No, that is a, a loaded and, and very broad question. Um, I, would, I wanna start uh, first by, by emphasizing something really, really important that can't be overemphasized. And that is there's a, a community of purpose and interest that is shared both by public and private actors, including industry. And that is um, we need to solve um, uh, the problems that, that came from the unequal pace at which the vaccines became and are becoming available around the world, right? So, so nobody should think uh, that the industry participants in this global effort are indifferent uh, to vaccine inequity. It's a, a great concern that must be solved as soon as possible. Um, so with that, um, I think just like we said earlier that success to the extent it is a success has many fathers while the, the shortcomings and failures that we can identify likewise have many fathers. Nobody in this whole effort from governments to public researchers to corporations can claim that they did everything right so far. Right? We had to learn a lot of things as we went along. I will just remind you, for example, uh, as, as Komal said earlier, that for some of the vaccines that we now know are safe and effective and, and very attractive products, and very important products for, for some of these products, uh, large scale production and supply lines didn't even exist at the beginning, right? They had to be created. So, so a lot of work went into last year into creating these assets, creating these vaccines and countermeasures. And uh, um, a lot of the actors, I can certainly say for the industry were very, very much focused on the task of let's first create vaccines Let's prove that they're safe and effective, that they're uh, approvable or that they're capable of being authorized for human use. And then we'll deal with the next issues that come down the road. But there was more than enough to do to keep everybody busy and keep everybody on task. Um, throughout, uh, what I've seen was that the debate over the role of intellectual property and concerns about potential obstacles posed by intellectual property evolved over the course of last year completely. And they changed in a number of ways. But there were a lot of actors and participants and commentators on the system who very early on in March of last year started talking about how they were very, very worried about the role of intellectual property, that it might hold up the creation and development of vaccines and countermeasures. But that manifestly didn't happen. These products were being researched, were being developed, and the narrative changed later in the year when it became clear that there would be approvable, safe and effective products. Then a different argument started to be made, right? People complained about the lack of transparency. And more recently, the debate changed completely away, for example, from patents as one dimension of intellectual property change to the discussion of uh, proprietary information, trade secrets, um, access to production cell lines, biological materials, blueprints, instrument specifications, and the like. So, so the debate over the role of intellectual property, at least from the side of the critics, has evolved very much and has adapted to the course of the pandemic. Uh, to a place where now we are discussing the involuntary and compulsory transfer, not just the non-enforcement of patents or IP, but we're talking now openly about compelling companies to share information and to force them into collaborations with partners that may not be suitable, that wouldn't otherwise be selected, and likewise. Right? So very, uh, I think, a, a very different big departure from debates we've had in the past. Um, and uh, I think we should all be aware that we've experienced a quantum leap in this debate over the role of intellectual property and public health. 
Now, okay, so what is a COVID waiver going to do? Um, I can tell you that for industry, it's difficult to constructively engage in debates over the waiver right now because the frame of reference is changing all the time. And people often aren't particularly clear about what they're trying to achieve. If, for example, the objective is <clears throat> to solve the current crisis and to increase production, then we need to talk about how we're going to maximize existing production capacity and identify to the extent it exists, and it's getting hard to find, how we identify additional production capacity that could be mobilized and recruited. Right? To solve this pandemic, it's probably not going to be helpful to construct entirely new capacities, to construct new factories, and to build up production chains that require their own inputs and supply chains um, that won't make by all projections a difference to this pandemic. We project that this pandemic will be solved with existing worldwide global production capacity. Now, if the frame of reference is the acknowledged and well understood need, for example, in Africa to build capacity, but to, to have more vaccine security for the entire continent. That is a different debate uh, and, and a very healthy and productive one to engage in. Right? This is a problem that we need to solve to be ready for the next pandemic. But it is very difficult, I think, for a lot of actors in the system, including the companies that are involved, to deal with proposals that play out against the background of a narrative of building capacity and empowering, for example, African countries to participate in vaccine production, but where the proposed solutions in the space of IP are primarily going to benefit countries that are not in Africa and that already have production capacity. Right? So if we want to talk about building capacity in the global south, that's what we should be focusing on and we should be targeting our solutions to that. What role intellectual property will play in this is hard to predict. I would say, again, that um, collaborative research and development, right? participation in IP systems, um, licensing technology um, is going to be a much more productive way going forward to solving this and to stand up production uh, and also R&D capacity that will help us be prepared for the next pandemic. It will be a much better way than jettisoning the existing global IP systems and stepping, for example, completely outside the framework of TRIPS and trying something entirely different. Sure. Uh, so Hans, like th this is very interesting and a very compelling set of points. But before I come back to you, uh, Josh, j just wanted to understand from you, you know, like uh, we, we keep on talking about IP waivers and things, but then copyright is possibly included in all this debate. and did you think enterprises like yours uh, could actually face a challenge uh, and how, how it could actually have an impact on your businesses as well? At the end of the day, it's about creating successful businesses uh, and so on and so forth. Josh. Yeah, I mean, I think potentially, and this is what I was um, alluding to in my opening remarks, like we have, especially with the transformation our company has experienced during the pandemic and all of the different use cases, we're starting to come into contact with uh, just new ways in which different parts of IP, including copyright, might be implicated. So we, we recently developed an events platform. So this is a sort of a qualitatively different experience than the Zoom meeting we're on. This would be uh, an experience where somebody would actually set up a, a, a virtual event, whether it's to, to teach a class or, or hold a seminar or, you know, teach, um, say it's a, a, a dance uh, instruction, you know, experience. Um, how do you treat the music that might be played in that context, for example? Uh, what kind of things do you have to think through? And so we've begun to think through all of the copyright implications that that new use case and that, that new way that people want to use our technology uh, are, are going to create. And so whether you're in video conferencing or, or any other kind of technology, as your use cases expand, you come into contact with new kinds of intellectual property considerations and 
you know, sort of uh, the, the, the follow on implication is that anything around a waiver, anything around the set of rules or derogations from those rules that, you know, form the basis for you moving forward in business, those come into play. So I can't say exactly uh, how we're going to confront the copyright issue. It's um, it, we're still in the phase of understanding the full implications of it. But I think it is certainly true that these kinds of uh, issues go go well beyond the, the critically important topic of public health into a variety of other uh, business and technology contexts. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Josh. So what you're really saying is that we need to have a certain rule of law or whatever that actually functions. But just just going deeper into this uh, conversation, uh, Elizabeth, what's what's your view uh, to this? Like you, you are an information enterprise, uh, as I would rather say, like uh, it can have huge impact on your businesses or how information probably shared or worked on and so on and so forth. Uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely true. And actually, I mean, before I answer your question, I just want to come back to something that other speakers have, have mentioned, because I've heard uh, Kamal has talked about it, I think um, um, uh, others have spoken about as well, the, the idea of vaccine hesitancy. And I would just want to add, because IP plays an important part here as well, that the, um, if you like, the direct relationship between fake science and fake news with vaccine hesitancy is, is completely connected. And you know, one of the things that STM publishers role and what we're trying to do is to counteract the fake news that's out there, the fake science, which has really been, particularly in particular groups of people have been really detrimental with the take up of the vaccine. And although it is an impossible, it's almost an impossible thing to stop the fake news and the fake science, at least you know where to go if you want to get proper science and proper outcome, uh, proper news. So I think it's really important to, to make to make that point that you know there's there's a broader role um, that companies like like us play. As far as the, the IP waiver, I mean, I think a lot has already been said. I think um, it, it, what you really need in business is certainty. And um, a waiver would, uh, it could potentially have detrimental consequences for the willingness of, of companies and organizations to cooperate because actually it puts into question that framework that gives the companies the trust to sign the contracts with other manufacturers, which they obviously voluntarily collaborate with. And I think it could serve as a disincentive. Um, and even if we were to accept, and I don't accept it, but if we were to accept that weekly IP could accelerate the use of some pre-existing innovations, I think the point is it would limit future innovation because innovators would be wary of trusting governments if, if there's this kind of general Damocles sword of losing IP rights hanging over them. And by the way, that's just the same for SMEs as it is for large companies as us, because that is a reliable source of investment and income. You need to know, you need to have reliability in order to invest which allows you to innovate. Mm -hmm. Very powerfully said, uh, Elizabeth. And uh, as we move forward, uh, Komal, like just a question to you, just just to get deeper into this conversation. You know, like uh, one is, of course, uh, I don't think there is any benefits for IP. It, it can actually create shrillness in terms of future action or future innovation and things. Uh, but in your point, uh, what, what more should be uh, done if we were is if, if not waiver, then what actions should be taken? What more should be done by the world? Uh, should we really focus on manufacturing more geographically or should we really look at uh, focus on distribution uh, or trade barriers? Uh, what do you think, Omar? Thanks, Amit. Uh, great question. So uh, again, I'm sorry, I'm going to be a lawyer for a second and says, depending on what context you ask me, if it's for the immediate short term, right? If it's for this pandemic, you need to remove trade barriers, you need to door share, and you have to make sure that countries have programs that can actually get shots into arm, which also includes countries giving out the right messaging for vaccination, right? Because the therapeutics, while they are there at the moment are for mostly for severe cases, but they are working, they will come. But you know that, that the vaccine right now is, is the most important thing. If you're talking about medium to long term, where the you know the technology transfer comes in, right? Talk, like I said, right now, honestly, I don't think we have like B 
PhD folks and you know the experts on tech transfer sitting there by the lake sipping a pina colada. They're on the shop floor doing their job. There's no capacity to spare, right? So that you need to build in systems to take that into to place. But for the long term, you know, honestly, and we, I think we've said this time and again, you need to create a sustainable innovation ecosystem. I've said this, I've been saying this for the last 10, 15 years, ever since I've been in this field. You need to put in education in place. You need to put infrastructure in place. You need to give it priority. It cannot just be when we're in the middle of a pandemic, then you, you know, then you're looking for that silver bullet. You're looking for that magic wand to fix it. And you, you fall back on something you've heard as rhetoric for, for the years. The IP waiver is not a silver bullet. Okay, you know, I, I'm probably going to be killed for saying this, but for a minute, let's say the waiver goes through. What is it going to do? Is it going to get you more production? No. You know, as Elizabeth and Hans mentioned, it, it's probably you're going to question your collaboration. Your collaborator is going to question, your licensee is going to uh, question, right? If anyone and everyone can make it. I think of CRISPR if it was made available on a public platform, which also has been suggested. Make everything available on the internet. Are you, I mean, <laughs> Are you going to then trust the vaccine that's going to be put in your arm? I mean, there are quality checks for a reason, right? It's going to or put pressure on an already stressed out regulatory um, department of every single country, right? So in the short term, I, I, I genuinely do not see any way that this is going to help you. They've thrown in trade secrets there. How are you going to implement that? You can come and read our offices, take our books, but the tacit knowledge that we have gained, you know, years of research and experience, you, you know, I mean, how are you gonna get that out? I'm not saying that we're not gonna do it or, you know, of course we're doing it, but we're doing, that's what I'm saying, we're already doing it. There isn't capacity to spare. So in the short term, I don't understand how this is going to be effective. And I'm not even getting into the legal argument where some countries have said, oh, let the waiver go through and then whoever wants to implement can implement it. Can you imagine from a jurisdiction point of view, the nightmare? I mean, it's great for a lawyer. I'm happy to go back and do litigation. It'll be great money. 30 but, seconds, Komo. Okay, but, but I'm saying, so yes, so short term, no effect, long term, Please focus on more sustainable innovation ecosystems that are collaborative, that involve stakeholders, because we are here, our doors are open to provide solutions. In the short and medium term, we've identified in the five steps, trade barriers, door sharing, country readiness, impetus to innovation, and scale up of manufacturing, which is already being done. Sure. And Hans, I have to pose a last one question to you on this. Uh, Komal has made a very passionate, uh, uh, compelling point that IP waivers should not happen. But what's your view? Do you think it might actually benefit uh, the world in any way whatsoever, uh, Hans? And please request you to keep your answer to two minutes. Oh, um, no, I, I, well, in my experience, but I cannot see that an IP waiver will substitute for, I think, the much more efficient way of collaborative R and D, what, where companies that uh, that find appropriate partners and trust each other, transfer their technology um, in in efficient ways to to partners that are able to receive it and to deploy it quickly, and and I would say the for example the the Indian biopharmaceutical industry is a case in point. I really want to want to give a shout out, right? A lot, so much technology has flowed to. Uh, Indian manufacturers during the course of this crisis, right? Uh, the country has been able to deploy very significant manufacturing resources um, and uh, has, I think, made a very significant contribution to worldwide output of not just vaccines, but also therapeutics. Um, so, so it is a good story. All of this happened, what right? absent a COVID waiver, all of this happened uh, uh, in much more traditional forms of partnering where companies that already knew each other were able to find each other 
and transfer the technology. So, so it is and has demonstrably happened. As I imagine going forward, as we prepare for the next pandemic, right, which will sooner or later come, um, I think we should learn lessons from this uh, that involve uh, a more, much more serious commitment to collaborative multilateral mechanisms. I will mention COVAX, but I think mechanisms like this will need to be in place um, because the reality is for better or worse, much of the pandemic response and the deployment of vaccines during and ongoing in the course of this crisis is also being driven by governments whose obligations first run to their own populations. This is what governments do. It's reality. It was predictable, but um, so um, I think for that reason, multilateral mechanisms that um, in advance give a lot of thought to a distribution, equitable distribution, and the flow of vaccines are going to be very important to consider and put in place going forward. It is true, though, that before you can think about distributing a vaccine, you must first have one. And I would say that, you know, the indust industry is particularly good at helping create these vaccines. It is pretty good at manufacturing them, but it is more difficult for industry alone to decide how they're going to be distributed around the world. But as we all know, there are many more actors involved in deciding how they are distributed than in deciding how they are made or where they are made. So um, again, I would put a big shout out to uh, multilateral efforts. Uh, and I think COVAX deserves much more um, of, uh, of a recognition, much more mention, much more discussion. If we talk about unsung heroes, it's one thing, but COVAX is one of the heroes that we should sing about and that okay. we should support much more. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you, Hans. Like as we move towards a closure, but I just want to go back to each of the panelists and each of the contributors. You, you know, like I, I know like the next pandemic might, will happen and it might happen much sooner uh, than uh, what we can anticipate. Like uh, the difference between the last two pandemics was 100 years. This time it might actually happen sooner. Uh, but I'm sure there are some very positive things for the future. Uh, how do you really look at it, Josh, for Zoom? Like, and from a business perspective, like newer opportunities, newer stuff, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there are new business opportunities, but they, they exist because, uh, you know, one of the very I guess, silver small linings of this um, tragic experience is just that people have rediscovered new ways to, to spend their time that are more personally meaningful and still able to accomplish what they need to do professionally. So we have kind of opened up uh, levels of flexibility and creativity around how people organize themselves and get work done and, and spend time with, with friends and family that we didn't have before. We just didn't have the, the impetus to, to think of before. And they happen to uh, align with the, the business uh, interests of, 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 of Zoom and a variety of other uh, companies, um, but hopefully we can, you know, take advantage of that future together. Thank you, Josh. And Elizabeth, over to you. What do you think for the future? 30 second uh, remark, please. Um, well, I think um, you need to encourage ongoing collaboration because um, I think that's really important. I think we've seen how it's taken us um, and we mustn't forget as things start to come back to normal, it's very easy to forget what it was like. We need to keep going. And of course, what's normal for us on this continent um, will be much later, sadly, for other continents. So we need to keep pushing, pushing it out and, and making it happen. I think we need to praise the unsung heroes and make them heroes. Stop trying to bash them. I think it's really important to, to really, you know, call it out where it's, where it's appropriate. Um, and I think we'll see, we haven't talked very much about AI, but I think we'll see how much AI will has and will continue to help um, solve future pandemics. I have many examples and I'm sure we could all bring them to the table, but collaboration in the field of AI um, is going to bring great benefits in the future. Thank you, Elizabeth. Komal, if you might want to say something in 30 seconds, no more than that. Okay, now I was writing it down, so I stick to time. Um, 
I think uh, obviously collaborations is very important, but I also think that industry needs to be seen as a solutions partner, not as someone you need to battle. We very are nice. here to provide solutions. That's one. Second, um, we need to have a predictable, stable policy environment and not have the rug pulled under us uh, in the middle of a pandemic. And thirdly, uh, which I strongly believe in that at such a time and God forbid we're, we're in one next time, you have to put science over politics. Thank you. And Hans, 15 seconds because our time is just up. Yes. For the future, the one thing we will have learned is we have to stay on task and avoid distractions. The discussion about the waiver and IP has been a distraction. It's becoming more of a distraction from efforts that we need to undertake going forward. If this happens again, we will have learned that we need to keep our nose to the grindstone and not leverage a crisis of this kind for uh, national industrial development or other purposes that have nothing to do with solving this particular crisis. And I will leave it there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Hans. But this is, as we really look at it, as we come to the end of this conversation, one final remark that I would like to say, that it is all about knowledge and collaboration as I see it. If we protect knowledge and if we collaborate right, we will be in a position to really resolve the crisis that we face in the future as well. We will need to respect uh, the uh, intellectual ideas that people generate, enterprises generate, because that is what is going to create a much more innovative world and a positive world. But on this note, I think I would like to thank each one of you for really joining us today for this amazing conversation, which, which of course really edged towards the edge, uh, a passionate uh, thing. But thanks a lot, Elizabeth, Komal, Josh, and Hans for joining us today. It has just been a pleasure and honor to have you with us. Thank you. Be well, be safe, God bless. Bye.